Okay, hello everyone, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce to Paulo Teixeira uh, for this coffee talk. Uh, Paulo is a mechanical engineering and also a master engineering in mechanical. Uh, he has from the University of Simon Bolivar. He has also more than 10 years of experience in the development of engineering, mechanical engineering and computational mechanics analysis. Um, he is uh, doing his PhD in the University of Porto, Portugal, at the Research Center of INEGI in the unit of composite material and structure. And he feel is in end-to-end -end simulation of fiber reinforced polymer composites. And he starts his PhD for 2020. Actually, he's uh, doing his PhD state here in Sydney in the group of CAMS. And he will talk about the, the work that has as a title, Micro Residual Stresses Analysis for Transversal Crack in Fisher. So, it's up for you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you, Fermi, for the great introduction. Um, Let's talk today about uh, some work that I was doing in the last year regarding micro residual stress analysis for transverse crack initiation in COPVs. This work is part of the first two years of my PhD that I was uh, working in Porto. Um, mm -hmm. Some parts are already uh, presented in conference and so on, but today I, let's try to discuss it in a more general way. So these are the topics that we are talking today, a brief introduction to composite pressure vessels, uh, what are transverse crack, what is the method methodology to study these aspects, and some results regarding uh, work examples that I have prepared for, for this meeting. So let's begin. Uh, in this work, I am focusing on uh, let me see if I can uh, hide this. You know what? Yeah, on this screen. Uh, no, no, that's the screen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, first, what are fiber reinforced polymers? Maybe if you minimize this, you can do it with a better. That's exactly. Yeah. This one. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. First, uh, let's introduce what are fiber reinforced polymers. Fiber reinforced polymers are materials that are general, uh, um, typically composed by two uh, materials, a fiber reinforcement system and a polymeric matrix. This matrix could be a thermoset or thermoplastic. It will dif differ how the, these materials are processed. Why are fiber reinforced polymers very interesting? For a simple reason. Fiber reinforcement system uh, usually has a high stiffness and very high strength. Um, these materials have, uh, at the end, um, greater strength, greater than, for example, metals, because composites are here, with a very reduced weight. So these are um, kind of materials that have a, a high specific strength. That's why they are very interesting in different industry sectors. Okay. In the other hand, what are composite pressure vessels? Pressure vessel, in the general point of view, is a container that is designed to hold substance at a pressure that is considerably higher than atmospheric pressure. Okay. The vessels are typically classified depending on the construction type in type one, that is the classic vessel that everyone knows, all metal. Type two, that are not very common, that is a metallic vessel with a composite hoop wrap. After that, we have the type three, that is an aluminum bezel that is overwrapped with composite uh, fibers. After that, we have type four bezels where we have a polymeric liner, the wall geometry, and a fiber reinforcement system. And at the end, we have the type five bezels that are a fully composite bezel with, without any kind of liner. 
there is no in uh, any model of internal structure to help support the visa. Why study this, this kind of visa? Type one are the more common in the market. Probably 90% of the visa in the market are of metallic uh, structure. Type three and type four, they have some years of their development and are very used in aerospace and aeronautic industry because they are uh, lighter than the metallic uh, tanks. But the type five is, is a conceptual, mm -hmm. Um, a design concept that is still in development. And if uh, the actual application is more related to a space application where saving weight is crucial. But in any case, it has still a greater potential to be further improved, to be applied, for example, in hydrogen technologies, um, cryogenic application for the space industry and so on. And this is why the, uh, the type five uh, pressure vessel are of relevant in are still in actively research. So looking to the another field, why study the manufacturing process in composite uh, materials? The first of all, the manufacturing process in composite materials is a very complex process because it involves a, a state that is um, constructing the, the part. And after that, we need to do a, a processing that involves heat and machines and so on. In a more generic point of view, the manufacturing process will lead to some defects in the material that will uh, introduce or reduce the mechanical properties and change the, the functionality. What are the most common defects or problems that are associated to the manufacturing process? Are we could have voids in the material, we have micro residual stresses, we can have uh, deformation because the material have different thermal expansion coefficients. Is, is the, the composite material is a thermal set resin it will shrinks when curing. And if the, if the manufacturing process is not well designed, it will have problems of incomplete curing or incomplete consolidation if it is a hot paste process and so on. So among this kind of uh, all of this kind of problem, why study transverse cracks? Transverse cracks are a kind of failure that is very common in composite material that usually happens before the fiber fail. Okay, so the material, the composite lamina will not break, it only will have transverse cracks. What is important? In general, they, they call the transverse fiber have a very low influence in the stiffness of the material because in the, the stiffness of the material and the strain is, is given by the fibers, not by the resin. But these transverse cracking are precursor for the lamination that will lead a catastrophic failure depending on the, on the structure. Looking to pressure vessels, it can be um, it can form leakage, leakage paths to, to the fluid and could also um, increase the material permeability if we are storing assets or any kind of material. There are some pictures that we are more or less seeing of how the transverse crack appears in a cross ply laminate with the, it is loaded. It is experimental work in a cross ply laminate. So, why micro mechanical models to study transverse cracks? First of all, the experimental work at a micro scale level is very difficult because the fiber size is around seven microns or less. So doing experimental work at this scale is very complicated. It's possible nowadays that there are some technologies that are making this possible, which is still very expensive and hard to reach. Aside, there are a lot of researchers in the literature that have made a lot of work using micromechanical models to study composite material, studying how the constituents, let's say, fiber and matters interact. So, um, to study the material properties, the mechanical performance, and have obtained good results. Having this in mind, what happens if we introduce also the manufacturing process to this analysis? We can include how the manufacturing process could affect the material properties. And this is relevant because we know that 
the nominal properties of the material are usually different to the as manufacturing properties that we get in the composite where we have a real part manufactured. Why? Because we have defects and we have residual stress. Okay. All of these points are more or less the motivation of, of the work that I am I'm doing. So let's proceed with the, with the next section. I don't know if, if there is any questions you're supposed to very present continuously or someone has a question, he will ask you. Okay. Anyway. So going to the methodology, how we can study that? First of all, um, I am focusing on studying thermoset material. Let's say the material, the manufacturing process uh, composed a first state where the material is laminated, is formed, and after that, it needs to be cured. The curing process is a thermochemical pro uh, process where the polymer is transformed from a gel or a soft state to the monolithic solid that everyone of us know. How we can characterize that? Since it is a thermochemical process, we need to, one of the most used tools to analyze the curing reaction is the differential scanning calorimetry test. We put a sample of the material, we measure how are the, the heat flow in the material when the curing process happens, and we can calculate and extract many things. For example, the specific head of the resin, the curing entropy, Let's say the amount of energy that the material needs to release to be cured. This is a quantity that could be measured. Taking this into account, we can define the degree of cure as the ratio of how much energy the material has released to the total energy that the material needs to release to be completely cured. This quantity goes from zero to one. Zero is, is not cured, one is completely cured. Okay. How we can, after that, model the Curing process. From many years ago, there are a lot of models to analyze the curing process. One of the models that is very used and very simple is the model proposed by Kamal. That is uh, this equation. You basically um, have some fixed parameters that are the uh, activation energy and some coefficients to fit that cure. With this, I can model how is the curing kinetics on the in the resin or having in the composite. But there are more things needed. Even if I already know how the material cures, I need to also know how the elastic models or the elastic properties of the composite or the resin evolve with temperature and with the cure degree, because the elastic models of the material is not the same at room temperature that, for example, at 100 or 100 of 20 degrees or 150 degrees. The temperature uh, influences the, the um, elastic modus. But I also need to know how the elastic modus uh, evolves with the curing degree. How we can do that? For that, it's possible to use the dynamical mechanical analysis, where we have a sample of composite or dressing, and we apply a load and move in a controlled temperature and frequency, and we test how the stiffness or the elastic model of the sample evolves with the temperature and time. Having this data and introducing a phenomeno phenomenological relation, I can relate how the elastic models evolve with the curing degree. It is not a linear relation. It means 50% of the curing degree did not mean that we have 50% of the elastic models developed. It's something different. This is a equation. We have some fitting parameter. I have the experimental data, I can do the fitting. And with this relation, I can predict how the elastic modulus evolves with the curing degree and change with the temperature. Okay. This is another ingredient that is required to do the analysis. Okay. Going to the mechanical part, we can do tensile and compression tests in the net racing and also in the composite using unidirectional coupons, longitudinal and transverse tension, in plane shear, transverse compression, measure all the properties that are commonly measured in the material to 
feed a numerical model if required. We will not spend too much time on that part. Okay. Now we need to simulate the curing process and the behavior of the, of the material to analyze how the residual stresses are developed in the matter. How we can do that? First, we already know that our elastic tensor is a, an elastic tensor that depends on the curing degree and the temperature. So we need to formulate an equal-elastic material law, law to define the constitutive relation. What does this mean? It means that the strain have an instantaneous elastic tensor that will change in time because it will change regarding the curing degree and the temperature. The stress-strain relationship need to be formulated in an incremental way and not in a total way. Okay. Um, this is um, the, one of the most relevant parts because uh, considering this formulation, I, when the curing process is simulated, the, this relation will say how the stresses will develop during the curing and during the cooling down. Okay. After that, the curing process has already ended. I still have to consider a constitutive model for the resin when it is already cured. And this is a more conventional model of how um, um, a more conventional con constitutive model will consider the same elastic tensor at the condition where the material have end the, the curing process. But now I have to include the, the mechanical feature, let's say. Uh, yielding, payload, and so on. How is one considered? The resin is a polymer and the material is as a pressure dependent behavior. So I have used the model proposed by Antonio Medro, that is a pressure dependent constitutive mm -hmm. model to predict the yielding initiation, initiation and also the failure initiation if I change the yielding stresses by the failure stress. This is the equation that you that is commonly used. And after that, when the failure of the racing is achieved, I have also introduced a continuum damage model to simulate the damage evolution and uh, model how is the, the crack propagation in the in the resin. Excuse me, can I make a question? Yes, please. Uh, Alejandro, sorry. Um, why are you using a, a, a hypoelastic uh, constitutive law? Is there any special reason for, for doing that? Yes, because um, I cannot use a, a total form of the elastic law because the elastic tensor will change of time in time. So it needs to be integrated. Doing, if I explain in another way, uh, the elastic, the um, okay, I, I understand the point. I understand. Let's say the, the if you see the stress strain, stress strain uh, behavior of the material, it will not follow a line. It will follow a exponent, something like an expo exponential curve. Because you have, a, um, let's say, an increase of strain due to temperature, but the, the OK, maybe this could work. It is something like that. So when the material returns, it will return always in the elastic way, but the evolution is not in the, in the elastic way. So the, the, only, the best way to define this evolution when curing is in the okay. 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 okay, okay. And I, I suppose that you're using this in for small strains? Yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. In the other hand, we I also need to consider to simulate how the lamina, the composite lamina, it means not only the resin, now so the material applied. Uh, it is what is the word? We have the fibers, the resin, and we have the composite flies. Okay, and I also have considered the model um, to simulate the laminar mechanical behavior. 
to, to simulate the pressure visceral and do the um, sublaminate model. How I can how I model the, the lamina? The lamina is considered to behave transversely isotropic because you have the fiber that is the principal direction and the transverse direction that is more weak. The elastic tensor have the similar behavior. We have an elastic tensor for the lamina that depends on the curing degree and the temperature also. And we have uh, the gelding and payload um, behavior that is also considered. For the transverse lamina, since it is an orthotropic and the plasticity is only um, developed in the transverse direction, not in the fiber direction, it is a model uh, very complex that is proposed that was proposed by Professor Pedro Camaño and Matias Boblev that is based in the stress environment. Not that no one, none of the stresses are in the fiber direction, it's only considered the stress in a state in the transverse direction of the material. A similar function. Uh, is used for the um, payload initiation, and in this side are the, the curve. How it works? Um, we need to go to this um, invariant uh, payload or gelding criteria, have the stress invariance E1, I2, I3, and have these coefficients that are um, the, um, the parameters that need to be fitted. How these parameters are fitted? We perform a lot of experimental tests to characterize uh, transverse strain, shear, compression. These are something complex to, to measure, but they could be approximated. So we can um, define these failure envelopes. There are some examples for the material that I, I am using. This curve corresponds to the failure, and this green curve corresponds to the yielding super. This is in the plane two, three, and this is in the, in the plane shear one, two. Uh, Axial stress due to. Okay. This is only to gelding to failure and failure initiation. But the model continues to be more complicated. After the failure is reached, we need to consider also the damage evolution. The damage evolution in the lamina model is more complex uh, than in the resin because the material is not isotropic. Um, for this, I have implemented the smear craft model. The middle curve model is a model that is based in the first criteria. Depending on the stress strength, we need to define a fractal plane. Okay. And there are some damage models that will say how the material will, will break on, uh, until the failure. Um, all of this is also implemented. And since it is a continuous damage model, uh, it needs to include also a um, mesh regularization strategy to avoid the mesh size dependence that is internally implemented. This um, mesh regularization is, um, is performed using the um, crack band approach that is a uh, common approximation using finite elements. This is used to guarantee that the fracture toughness uh, translated to the volumetric uh, fracture energy is always keep constant. So if I change the element size, we need to adjust the stress strain curves always to guarantee that the fracture tolerance is keep constant, okay? To maintain the model, the, the model consistency. Okay, this were the constitutive part. Let's go to the more practical part. Um, to demonstrate for what it's, it's, it will be useful, uh, let's define a, an example uh, pressure vessel, type 5, of course. We have a 5700 prepared material. We have a very simple layout and, and a small vessel with a 300 millimeters length and a diameter of 150 millimeters. The layout is plotted in these parts. We have the five layers. And this visual is modeled using one eighth of the geometry. It is an approximation because the fibers are not exactly symmetric, but the model is a cycle for the sample that we want to do. I have considered one element for, for material layer. And the angle variation and the thickness in the, in the heads is also considered to, to model this, this part. In the other hand, this is not a couple model. This is a parallel application of the model. 
I also have um, introduced um, a sublaminate model. What is a sublaminate model? <clears throat> Consider the same layout that is used for the pressure vessel. I have um, um, extracted the play, the play stack layout. Okay, so I have considered the internal layers uh, discretized at micro scale level. That's it, it means that the um, fibers and resin are discretized by separately, and the other adjacent layers are are discretized considering the homogenized material. Okay, this portion of the this lamina have a micro mechanical model discretization. The other adjacent layers have an homogenized uh, layer model. This model is 3D. You can see in the in the lesson. Okay, this is an important thing. These are the actual orientation of the vessel. I have rotated it to facilitate the interpretation to zero degrees in the internal layer. More details of the sublaminate. The sublaminate matter is a very small portion of the complete thickness. So the, um, the finite element model um, that is considered half is 3D, but it's very thin because I am considering striped fibers in the in the material. It only has three elements in the thickness, and it has periodic boundary conditions in the sides. Each layer is coupled to a master node, and every master node is coupled to, a, let's say, a primary node. Okay, this uh, upper and bottom surface are free because it is if we've seen in the real material, there there are free surfaces, and this is the internal surface of the vessel. There is nothing. The only coupling is to guarantee that the material could be stuck. And let's say this layoff is repeated in the side direction and in the normal direction of the screen, okay? This is the, the finite element model. Okay, let's go to the results. I will begin in the con in, in the other context. And this is the interesting part. First, using the sublaminate model, I simulate only the curing process, okay? Let's say we have a typical, let's say, outer color cycle, we have heating, and cooling down. Let's see that this is 100 degrees. The material heats, begins to cure, and after that, cools down. What happened? If we see at the micro scale level, then there are developed some internal micro residual stresses because the fibers and the matrix have different thermal expansion coefficients. And besides that, the resin, that, that is a thermoset, exhibits a phenomenon that is called shrinkage, a chemical contraction that uh, tends to reduce the volume of the material. The combination of these two effects develops an, a distribution of internal stress to, to achieve the local equilibrium, let's say. There is a description of how are the pressure stress, the pressure stress, the volumetric part, and the bone of stress that gives a um, mixture of the deviatory component of the stress stage. Okay. This is at the micro level. If we go to the mesoscale scale level, we, we see okay, since this laminate have different orientation, it also becomes the orthotopy, orthotopy of the laminates have different thermal expansion coefficient. And um, what is curious? Oh, <clears throat> let's say it's also evident. Each one of the layers have a residual stress, okay? Because one lamina want to, to expand, and then after that, they want to contract. But the adjacent layers did not allow that. So the, the complete layoff need to achieve an internal equilibrium, okay? And this internal equilibrium induces that, for example, in this micro, in this internal layer that is um, modeled at the micro scale level, develop uh, an amount of almost 28 megapascals. But what is curious, from the test, the transverse strength of the, of the lamina is 42.9. Let's say only the residual stress in the lamina at the mesoscale level achieve almost 
65% of the strength of the land. If we apply for the loading, what will happen? It will begin to appear the famous transverse crack. Much before that, the complete laminate fails because we have fibers in the direction that could sustain a lot of loading, but not the transverse layers. <clears throat> Let's see more in detail what happened. If we apply loading in the, in the lateral direction to the sublaminate model, what will happen? Of course, failure will appear. The failure will appear depending on the local arrangement of the fiber. This fiber is generated with a random algorithm. It's not a clear um, starting point. The opening of the failure in the free surface, in the free surface is higher than in the internal, in the interface with the adjacent light that is clear. But what happened at the complete um, sublaminate part? The complete sublaminate stress strain response have this behavior. Here we have a, a small drop of the load because you lost one lamina carrying on capacity. Okay. But the other layers are still sustaining load. If we see how the, each one of the lamina in the sublaminate behaves, we can see that the 50 and 30 degrees lamina are still okay, the larger body and only the transverse uh, ply that is failed have the load drop here. Okay. This is why the transverse fracture is not completely relevant if we see the whole picture because the, the load drop is not very important. If we have a bigger laminate, this chain is small, but if we see in the local part, we see that one lamina breaks and is not capable to sustain more load. If we have a fluid, what will do the fluid will permeate to the, to throw this crack uh, leakage path. This part was considered the sublaminate model. If we go to the applying the same methodology, we now we use the macro uh, pressure vessel model. We repeat the curing simulation. Uh, we see that the again the residual stresses in each one of the lamina have more or less the same order of magnitude that we get in the sublaminate model. In this case, the outer lamina is what gets the higher transverse stress. If after that we apply pressure, what we what we can see without considering the residual stresses from manufacturing, the failure, the pressure that is needed to activate the transverse damage is 28 bars. Okay. But if we consider the residual stress state that we get from the previous uh, um, slide. The failure to the, the, the internal pressure to activate the transverse damage in the internal layer is 14 bars. So the load current capacity is reduced to the half. This does not mean that the, that the vessel will slow. It only means that a crack will appear and maybe a, a leakage, a leakage is could happen. <clears throat> in any case, the fiber leakage is achieved. 245 bar. Okay. Depending on the fluid, the material, the case uh, will develop there. Okay, so to conclude, micromechanical analysis can give a good description of the micro residual stresses and what happens at this micro scale level that is very complex to do in experimental way. Uh, consider this, the applied residual stresses that are developed during the manufacturing is very relevant because depending on the laminate configuration and the geometry, we can achieve a higher amount of stress that can trigger, for example, the transverse uh, failure mode that could be critical in some applications. Okay? Uh, this kind of sub laminate modeling approach uh, is it's also very interesting to analyze how uh, the failure can be um, initiated 
considering the uh, constraining effect of the ISA layer. No, it's, it's very different is I only simulate one layer that I simulate a layer embedded in a sublaminate, the local stiffness that is that is added to this uh, ply by the adjacent layer, we change locally how it will behave. So it is a relevant effect that needs to be considered. Uh, looking to the pressure visual example, the transverse uh, damage mold can reduce considerably the pressure load carrying capacity, of course. And unfortunately, residual stresses should be considered to avoid the premature transverse crack initiation, as we can see in this example. Sorry. And we can see the work in this mode. <laughs> Two true works. Uh, what I intended to do is to expand all this work to simulate the cooling down to cryogenic temperatures because this kind of vessels have a great potential to be applied to store a uh, liquid oxygen. Uh, or any substance in cryogenic condition. Cryogenic condition is uh, a cost-effective solution to store some substance because they have a higher density. Um, for the pressure visa example, I need to include additional loading cases and size pressure like uh, accelerations, uh, compression loads, and so on that are more typical um, a real application. And another thing that I still need to work is to include the longitudinal damage model in the laminate, in the mesoscale model. That is what I am doing here with uh, in Sydney with my colleagues, Fermin and other people, is to try to include the longitudinal damage part in the mesoscale model. And this is all. Well, thank you, Paulo. I think it has no. been uh, really interesting. I don't know if there are other questions. In any case, I have one. Uh, in the in the first point of the future work, I think it was the first point, or maybe the second one. Yeah, yeah that's the, the first one. Uh, temperature dependence. Uh, this means that are you going to do like a couple thermomechanical calculation? Yes. And then affect material properties according to the temperature field. Uh, we are, I already have in uh, the last months do some some additional work. What is intended is to perform the same dynamical mechanical analysis test, but instead, instead of look only room temperature, let's say 20 degrees to 100 degrees, I want to see 100 degrees to minus 200 degrees, for example. So the complete temperature range. Uh, what is interesting is that, for example, the resin. The elastic modulus of the resin increase almost three times. Okay, mm -hmm. the resin at room temperature is about 200, 2000 of megas, and it goes almost to 600 of, uh, of megas. This is why they need to consider the temperature dependence. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's clear. But the evolution of the temperature field. I mean, how are you gonna compute it, or you're, are you gonna impose okay. it? Okay, I understand. For the sublaminate model, I impose, I, am, I impose the homogeneous temperature and mm. because the geometry is very, very small. When I simulate, for example, a visual or a bigger component, I need to do the thermal analysis because the temperature profile is not homogeneous. Okay. Okay. That, that, that so was the question. Thank you. Exactly. Mm. So I need to simulate first the, I, I have to do two ways. Or first simulate the thermal part and get the temperature history. Or sim made a simulation couple temperature plus mechanical in a couple analysis. For what we are doing, for what I am doing, I prefer to do first the thermal part and following the, the mechanical part using only the temperature field because we I do not have couple effects or a strong coupling effects. Okay, so I don't there is the temperature will not change any displacement of the structure. Yeah, that's true. Usually with one one way coupling should be enough in this. Exactly. Case. Exactly. Thank you. This is one part. The other part is the failure modes. The failure mode is because uh, minus 200 degrees, uh, the properties of the material change, transverse strain and 
all of the uh, composite properties. Well, I only have a, another question because I, I, I'm planning to deep into this uh, at some point. Okay. It is clear that the that the Yau modulus can be affected by the temperature, but how do you affect the strength of the material, like the yield stress, or have you any? Uh, I mean, do you have any evidence of how it evolves? It decreases too, I suppose, uh, with according to the increase of temperature, for example. How the yield stress will change with temperature? Yeah. It, okay. Uh, for um, hot temperatures, I have never tested the material, for example, at 80 degrees. Um, but for lower temperature, the material tends to be more brittle. Let's say the, the yielding and the, the failure stress need to be more similar. Okay. When I do the curing simulation, um, for for example, the, the, only the curing part. Um, let's say I. It's like an hypo hypothesis that the yielding stress will always be higher than the auto stress. Or let's say another word, the material will not yield because it yield, if it yields, the, the model didn't work. Or it's it's not a natural way. No, I don't know if it, do I make a space. Let's say. I have the, the yielding model active, active but the, the, the stress, the, the development of the residual stress is always inside the yielding envelope. It never reached the yielding or the failure strain. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. If I could suppose that the yielding is 10 megapascal, 10 megapascal and maybe there are some conditions that the material cross the gelding, okay, it will go to the gelding um, region, but I never get this, this part. But let's say when the material cool down, it gets, for example. When the material cool down in this region, more or less, There is no thing now. What you want to say is that uh, when when I I when this simulating the cooling down, it's possible to get some yielding or some plasticity in the narrower laps of the of the of the fibers, okay? Because there are a lot of stress concentration, but not in the cooling part at, at one hundred twenty degrees. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. But the question is more related that. Okay, let's let's stick to the low left uh, figure, for example, that you reduce temperature, so you have some kind of shrinkage and you induce this tensile damage, right? Okay. The question is the tensile damage that you're computing, it's according to a certain strength of the material in those points, right? Yes. That strength could be potentially affected due to temperature. The strength of the material, of course. Okay. Besides the young modulus, for example, it's, it's evident that the young modulus of, of the fibers will be affected or, or, or the resin. Yeah, but no. the, the, the yield strength, is, it, it should be also affected. Yes, uh, the strength of the resin changes considerable. Uh, it's very dependent of temperature, even in the hot part and in the cool, in the in the full part. Of course, okay. when, I, when I get the, the result, it is at the wrong temperature. Now, in comparing these, these strength values, 28, with the value uh, of the strength measure also at the room temperature. For example, doing this comparison at 50 degrees, and maybe the strength of the composite is another value, but I, I don't know how much it could be. But I, can assume or, or presume that it will be different because, in fact, okay. for aeronautic, um, in aeronautic industry, they also characterize the composite at 85 degrees, and the materials are, are still are considerably different. Not much, but they are, they are different. 
Okay, that was the question. Thank you. Good. Any other question? Like a last slide before the conclusions, you show your microscopic model. Uh, the macro model, the, the full component simulation. You work the, this conclusion if you consider the stresses, like the, the, the failure is uh, happens way lower uh, loading. How do you couple or how do you input the, the, the residual statics into your macro simulation? So, what is the transition between the previous slide and this slide? Let's say. Okay, I have two steps. The first step we perform the curing part, let's say apply temperature to cycle. So the material will cure and we do everything as you get this point. This is the state at the end of the first step. The second step will start at this point and you apply pressure for CO2 to some value, let's say 50 bar. And you see that, for example, okay, at 28 bar, you begin to have a uh, some yielding, and after that, you activate the damage model, and the damage begins to evolve in the element, and so on. And the simulation, the, the curing part, and the simulation are, are doing in one way continuous. So, the first step you apply the temperature profile, heating, curing, and cooling down. Second step, mechanical loading. And after that, suppose that I need to do pressure, and after that, do acceleration. A third step. With another loading. You get it? No, but the curing simulation is basically the simulation of the manufacturing, right? Yes. The curing simulation is implemented in the same mechanical constitutive model. This is made in Abacus. You have a, you can implement user subroutines, and in the user subroutine, you have a subroutine that have this implement. So okay, so in the constitutive low. Yeah, it has a super okay, I, yeah. I integrate, I have the, the first equation I present for the how the curing in the curing kinematics. Considering temperature and the resting properties and the temperature profile, you're integrating the curing state. With the curing state, you calculate the elastic model. With the elastic model, you calculate the increment of the stress strain, and this is the, the work of the constitutive part. And this also happened in the first step. And the constitutive model is implementing a subroutine. That's why I can do this in a couple or on couple way with a thermal solver. If I have a thermal simulation also. If I have a thermal simulation also, let's see. Okay. Um, what I was saying. If I have the thermal part, I simulate the heat transfer, you get the temperature profile, or maybe the temperature in the region is different. And so the curing evolution in all the geometries is slightly different. Suppose you have a press, a very thick laminate that is not practical, and you apply heat from one side. What is the part that will hit first? This is the first layer. So this part will cool first, and this will cool later. And after that, you have the cooling down. What region will cool down first, the dome or the roof? So you will have internal gradient of temperature. In this case, I am imposing the temperature from the temperature of all of the geometry is the same. Just to simplify, we're doing the another case, it's just a matter to include another step. The only question I was trying to come to this laboratory, not leaking the session. Thank you again. <laughs>